All right, we'll be in Acts 15 today. Um, this is uh, commonly known as the Jerusalem Council. If you have headings in your Bible that may say the Jerusalem Council, this is um, a time when an issue that's coming up in the church gets taken to Jerusalem, and uh, the apostles and the elders are going to wrestle it through and ask the Lord what he wants and give us in scripture here an indication uh, of the, and the clarity of what God would, would have done here. So if you're, uh, if you're there in Acts, um, Acts 15, I just want to remind you of a few things. Last week, uh, I talked to you extensively about the gospel, and I want to always remind you that we are saved by faith alone and through God's grace alone, through the finished work of Christ, Christ alone, that there's nothing we bring to it to be saved. And these men, these Judaizers, were trying to tell the Christians that they had to be circumcised. And I talked about legalism, and I talked about adding to the gospel, and not adding to the gospel, okay? Not adding church membership, not adding anything to the gospel. But you stand before, when you stand before God, he looks at you, and you're in one of two categories. Category one, you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, you're clothed in his righteousness, you're God's child, God loves you, God brings you into his kingdom. Category two, you chose to resist Jesus Christ your whole life. You tried to live a good life and please God yourself. Not happening. Not happening. You're not getting into God's heaven that way because the heaven doors, heaven's doors only open by those who are redeemed by Jesus Christ. Okay? Because if you lived a perfect life, well, then there's two messiahs. I don't think that's true, right? So, okay, so let's, uh, let's get down to uh, Acts chapter 15. So they were trying to add to the gospel, so it's important to know that. And I put in here, I put the, um, the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel, and it's not to add extra biblical burdens um, to the truth of the gospel. And I think it's important on the front side to say, you know, is this something that is, is something that I struggle with. Jesus Christ and something. Uh, when you get to Acts 15, it's very fascinating because it also parallels another passage in Scripture. It parallels Galatians 2. And Peter had come up to Antioch, the great apostle Peter. He is called by Cephas in Galatians chapter 2. And when Paul gets there, uh, Peter... And Antioch's in Syria, there were Jews in the congregation, there were Gentiles. Peter had started to move away from the Gentiles and only eat with the Jews. And Paul publicly confronts him in front of the whole church. That's pretty intense. And he confronts him, say, you're a Jew. And you live like a Gentile. Because you don't live under the law anymore. You live under the law of Christ. You live for Christ. Why are you going back and just spending time with the Jews? And, and, uh, and Peter repents of that. And this is a parallel passage because there was all this strife. As the Jews and Gentiles were in the same body, how do we get along? How do we, how do, how do we spend time together? How do we associate with each other? Jews were told their whole lives that Gentiles were only born to fuel the fires of hell. Pharisees would get up in the morning and say, thank you, God, that I was not born a Gentile. Uh, I'm a Gentile. We're all, I mean, I don't know, if maybe some of you are Jewish here, but I would assume that we're all Gentiles. There's only Jews and Gentiles. It's, you know, they're like one sixtieth of the world's population. They're kind of a minority. <laughs> but they just believed they were God's chosen people, and that God did not choose the Gentiles. Now, I can argue very uh, persuasively, at least in my mind, from the Old Testament, that the Gentiles are listed all through the Old Testament. It was never about just the Jews. But God needed a people, needed a mouthpiece. He needed to put them in a place where all peoples could see him. And he gave paths for Gentiles to come to him, even in the Old Testament. So the church is now struggling. How do we have the Jews and the Gentiles come together? What's the, what's the heart of the gospel? 
The gospel is to produce joy and peace and love in, in and among peoples, and yet this council had to be held and had to be worked through to figure out what was the posture that the Jews and Gentiles needed to take toward each other. Because it was very simple for the guys who were Pharisees that just said, you guys all need to get circumcised and follow the customs of Moses, the dietary laws and all that stuff, because that's what we do. And even though we're Christians, you got to do what, what we do. And, you know, for their whole lives, uh, they ate a certain diet. And they lived a certain way. I'll never forget when I was living around some Mennonites and they said, do you like cheese? And I said, oh yeah, I, I love cheese. They said, have you ever had head cheese? Now, I didn't have my smartphone on me, so I didn't Google it in front of them. I said, you know, no, I've never had that. They said, it's delicious. I, I was concerned when I heard head cheese, so I said, so, so how do you get the head cheese? And he talked to me about how they would boil the pig brain and get the jelly. And he said, he just remembers as a kid, he would do it with his dad, and then they'd take spoons and, like, eat the brains. Uh, trust me, Mennonites let no part of the pig go to waste, okay? Like, they are, there's n there are no dietary laws among the Mennonites at all, <laughs> you know? And I, and I thought, you know, here we are, both Gentiles, you know, and, and I have some Mennonite blood in my family line, although we, we missed out on some of those delicacies. And, and I thought to myself, as I looked at them, I thought, you know, there's certain cultural things that people find acceptable, that they, you know, that I have to tell you, for, for years I lived in and among them, and I avoided the head cheese, okay? I, I, I held out, um, because it was an offensive food to me. Right? So we're always kind of wrestling that through. And so the council has to get together and say, okay, so let's talk about this whole thing that's happened with the Gentiles, and then let's figure out what we need to tell them, how they need to interact with the Jews. And we're going to get to that at the, at the kind of the end here. So they, they call them together. Now I'm just going to backtrack and read a little bit and then, and then get to verse 6, which is where we start our heavy spiritual food today. Um, it says, when they arrived at Jerusalem, verse 4, they, they received by the church and the apostles and elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them, or the Gentiles, and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So they're in this group, and some of the Pharisees stand up and say, the Gentiles need to be circumcised, and they need to observe the law of Moses. It says, the apostles and elders came together to look into this matter. So that's where we get the council. And after there had been much debate, discussion, investigation is what that word debate means over this controversy. Peter stood up and said to them, brethren. So the first testimony we get here is Peter. And what's significant about that is Peter was the first one to take the gospel to the Gentiles. When the gospel came to the Gentiles, it went to Samaria through Philip, kind of half Jews, half Gentiles. Peter had to go up and check that out, make sure it was good to go. You know, in Matthew 16, when he confesses Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, he says, you're Peter, and on this rock I'm going to build my church, and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And so you'll hear people tell jokes when you get to the pearly gates and you meet St. Peter because they assume he has the keys to heaven, you know, and then the joke goes from there. Well, <clears throat> that's not the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom were that Peter was present. The day of Pentecost, Peter was the preacher who saw people come to Christ among Jews from all over the known world. The Samaritans, when they got the gospel, Peter went up and put his stamp of approval on it. When the gospel goes to the Gentiles, although Peter worked with the Jews, Peter was the one that took the gospel to the Gentiles. The first Gentile, Cornelius, came to Christ because of the teaching of the Apostle Peter. So he saw the kingdom extend from the Jews to the Samaritans to the Gentiles. And in Acts 1.8 it says, You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you it, to be my witnesses. That's what it's for. To Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. And Peter is the one who always took the keys of the kingdom to that next spot 
when the gospel went out. So when it went to the Gentiles, that covered all humanity. He didn't have to keep going to every geographical location, but he, he's the one who is God's representative to take those keys of the kingdom. Um, so I hope that brings some clarity. Uh, that is a, uh, a teaching that you'll hear in, I would say, hyper-charismatic circles that's often twisted what the keys to the kingdom are. And I don't know if you've heard teaching about that. I'm not asking for who did it or when they did it, but it's just important to realize the keys to the kingdom were the fact that gospel would go out to these, um, to these peoples. <clears throat> hope, that, hope that helps in some way. All right, so uh, the first point in the outline is watch out uh, for people who load a burden on you or burden loaders. It's verses 6 through 11. Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know in the, that in the early days God uh, made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And that's really the only thing we do is we put our faith in the teachings of the gospel, right? Um, we, we, we say, I believe this. I have faith in it. That's how we become believers. Some people argue over, are they elect? Is it free will? And I say, Lord, you know, like uh, Spurgeon said, said, save the elect and elect some more. Like, we preach the gospel. We preach the gospel. And these Gentiles believe. They put their faith in it. And God chose Peter to do this. And so he reminds them of this. They put their full confidence, their belief in the person and work of Christ. Now you have to realize, the Gentiles were polytheists. They worshipped nature, and they worshipped all kinds of crazy gods. And they did horrible things in their temples. I mean, horrible things that I, I don't want to really get into. It wasn't that they didn't worship anything. It's not that they were atheists. They worshipped all kinds of crazy gods. And they heard the gospel of one God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and they got rid of all their gods and put their belief in him. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us also. Okay, who are Christians? Those who have received the Holy Spirit. You put your faith in Christ, Christ baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit. And based on that, you know you're a Christian. And sometimes you've talked to somebody that you've gone, I, I'm pretty sure they're a Christian. Because your Holy Spirit communicates with their Holy Spirit, and you're like, whoa, that person's a Christian. It's happened to me many times. It's so cool. Um, so he, um, he gave them the Holy Spirit. And then verse 9, and he made no distinction between us and them. So the Gentiles believed. Can you pull up the Genesis 15, 6? This is the teaching that ties the book of Genesis all the way through the end of the book. Because it says in Genesis 15, 6 that he believed, Abraham believed in the Lord, and it reckoned to him as righteousness. It didn't say that Abram did a bunch of works. It wasn't that he, he did something and didn't do something else. It says he put his faith his belief in God, and God credited him that as righteousness. And when you read the book of Romans, Romans is written to remind us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, and that we receive faith, and we put our belief in Jesus Christ, and that's the righteousness God accredits with, us with, and it ties us back to the person of Abraham. So this is pre, I mean, this is before the Jews were Jews. Okay, this is, Abraham was not a Jew. He was called out of Babylon. He was the father of the Jewish nation, um, and he received the covenant of circumcision. But he was the first Jew. But he started out as a Gentile and then became a Jew. Okay? So I say that to you to say, it's always been about belief. And it's always been, once we put our belief in Christ, there's no distinction in verse 9. And in the book of Galatians, now rem I remind you again that Galatians was written to this group that Paul went on his first missionary journey to, Paul and Barnabas, in central Turkey. And this verse is in Galatians 3, 28. In Christ, there is no Jew or Greek. You got it for me? Yeah. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And Peter says here, he made no distinction. No distinction. It's not like 
You know, there's the Jewish group that are the favored Christians, and there's those poor Gentiles that we're getting in, but, you know, we're, we're a subclass. I mean, it, most religious systems have class structure. Hindus do. M- M- Muslims certainly do. Um, even sometimes when you stay within the umbrella of Christianity, you have, you know, the bishop, the archbishop, the priest, the, uh, all these structures, right? Uh, Pastor Joe Foch calls those veil menders. Remember when Christ died, the veil to the Holy of Holies was ripped in two? Don't let somebody sew that veil back together to put a barrier between you and God. There's no distinction. So now the Gentile who puts, puts his belief in Christ is now has the Holy Spirit just like the Jew. Just like the Jew. And so there is no distinction between us and them. Cleansing their heart by faith. So we cannot separate Jews and Greeks anymore. This is wrong, and we will not do it. Now, it's fascinating because this is such the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is that all who believe are received by Christ on the basis of faith, not of works. And by doing that, we receive the Holy Spirit, and we receive his grace. And that's the gospel. And that you're as much as his child as I am. And he answers your prayers just like he answers mine. God doesn't go, oh man, you know, um, this guy, he's got four generations of ordained pastors in his line. His prayer, you know, we've got to move it up on the chain. Doesn't happen. No distinction. I love that about our God. I hate class warfare. I hate class structures. I like being an American where where we we are just people. You don't need to know my last name. You don't need to try to pigeonhole where I'm from. You don't need to know my accent. I mean, George Orwell struggled so much because he was born to an upper class family that was poor. And he would talk all the time about hanging out with people that didn't have their H's. Because you know, poor people in England say like av as opposed to have. And the rich people say the H. And he talked about how he wished that it would be a society where it didn't matter if you had an H or didn't have an H. And we always wrestle with that, right? There's classes and distinctions. At the foot of the cross, it is flat ground. Flat ground. Men, women, children can all come to Christ and receive his Holy Spirit by faith. And you're his child. And you can say, you don't know what I've done. Well, I guarantee you, you haven't done genocide, which is kind of what the Apostle Paul did. Okay? I mean, he he murdered Christians. He put them in prison. He tortured and abused them. Okay? And he wrote a large portion of the New Testament. God changes people. He changes us. That's why I love you guys, and every time I I see a step of faith, I just affirm that. A step of obedience, I just affirm that. Okay? We just love you guys. Now, he goes on to say this, and this is a great question, and you can tell it's like a Jewish rabbinic question. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the necks of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Like, why are you putting a burden on them that we couldn't do? Like, you can tell there's probably silence there. And the Pharisees are like, okay, okay, good point, good point. You got, you know, good point. Why do we want to go back to that system of law? I I heard a guy, Damien Kyle, said, he said a great thing. He said, he said, if, and, and he said, if your salvation was dependent on you, just one thing, just, let's say when you come to Christ, you get given a ticket, just a ticket, and that ticket will get you into heaven. And I, he just, it was a great sermon illustration. He said, you put it in your pocket, and how many times would you rub your pocket to make sure it's still there? Right? Like, where would you store it at home when you're sleeping? How would you just, all the time, worry about making sure you had that ticket? You've got to have the ticket. He said, that's just a simple ticket. Like, none of it depends on us. No part of this can depend on you. None of it. And he says, why would we put a yoke on them, which is a burden that they would have to bear, that we couldn't bear, but we we believe that we are saved 
through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. And I've got to throw up Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You've heard it before from me, but it's important to hear. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So the only thing we do is we put our faith in the finished work of Christ. And that's our full confidence, our belief, that it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And verse 9 goes on to say, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And we know that the Pharisees were very proud of keeping the law. And he says that they had been saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way, uh, the same way as they are. We are saved in the same way they are also. So he goes to say, Peter's saying, it was God's grace. It was through faith. They have the Holy Spirit. There's no distinction. They are our brothers in Christ. Now, we have to realize that the cultural gap between Jews and Gentiles was massive. I mean, just massive. And I don't know if you've ever, um, years ago, I, uh, I candidated at a, um, at a Chinese church that was looking for an English-speaking pastor, and uh, it was up in Toronto, and uh, I don't know why they wanted to hire me, but um, the second generation were kind of like half Chinese, half Canadian, and they needed somebody who could kind of help bridge the cultural gap. So I went in, I preached, we did, we did kind of a, a weekend with them, had a really good time with them. And the, um, the lead pastor from Hong Kong said, let's go out to eat. I said, okay, let's go out to eat. I don't know where he's going to take me. Well, he took me to, um, to, to a place where I had to request for a fork. You know what I'm talking about? I looked around and went, I, I can't do something with these chopsticks. I need a fork, okay? I, I'm an American. Um, and, and all we ate that night were uh, fillets of, of raw fish. I don't, mean, I don't mean sushi that have like a little dab of raw, I mean like just a chunk of raw fish. It was called sashimi, if I remember correctly. And he said to me, he said, we know that it's fresh when we eat it raw. I was like, wow, this is awesome. I remember looking at Jen. Yeah, let's just say I have never been sicker in my life. Like we were driving home from the meal, and it was cold. And I'm like, Jen, I am not, I, I, I got to find a bathroom somewhere. I am not doing well, you know. But, 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 but for the pastor, that was like perfect dietary laws. That's what they ate. That's what they loved. That's, that's their culture. And I'm looking at him going, we prefer it cooked so we know the bacteria is taken care of, you know. Come on. Because I haven't developed the antibodies. But the, but, but the point is, is that these wide cultural gaps, and we still have them among peoples that are here today, even in our local area, there's some wide cultural gaps. And we have to realize that these are people Christ died for, even if they speak a different language than us, even if they have a different religion. I have to tell myself, every time I see a Muslim, Christ died for that person. Because I always think, you're coming here to take over America, and I don't want you to do that. And then I have to think, which is probably true, and then I have to think, but Christ died for them. But Christ died for them. And Christ, God is bringing the mission field to us. And if we make no distinction, and if we love them, and we show them his, his truth, God will save some. And so Paul, uh, Peter gives the first testimony as kind of the lead apostle. The next testimony we see is Paul and Barnabas relaying their missionary journey from Acts 13 and 14. And they say this, and they say it um, very succinctly. It's all the peoples kept silent, obviously, after what Peter had said. And they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So in verse 12, Paul and Barnabas say, let me explain to you what happened in our missionary journey and how God did signs and wonders and how they come to, came to faith. It was amazing. And so not only have we heard from Peter and what happened with Cornelius, now we've heard what's happened in Galatia. And again, they're all there. They're all quietly listening. And then at the very end of this debate, James, it says, and when they'd stopped speaking, James answered saying, Brethren, listen to me. Well, we know in Acts 12 that James, you've got Peter, James, and John, the inner core. James, John's brother, Herod puts to death. So obviously that's not this James. Uh, there was uh, James, uh, the son of Alphaeus, or the lesser. He was one of the disciples. Um, it's not him. 
The this James, actually, we know through church history, Eusebius tells us that he was uh, the head of the church in Jerusalem, was James, the physical half-brother of Christ. And he was actually known uh, as camel knees. He had very bad knees. And he had bad knees because he spent so much time on his knees in prayer. Uh, James thought his brother was crazy in the Gospels, that they came, to, as he was teaching, to take him home, to try to figure out what was wrong with him. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that when Christ resurrected, he appeared, and it gives a list of who he appeared to. And it says he appeared to James also. It says he appeared to the twelve, so those two, first two James that I mentioned would have been in the twelve. It said he appeared to James also. And James is his physical half-brother. And then, of course, Jude, who wrote Jude, is another half-brother, and uh, they both are chosen to write uh, books of the Bible. The book of James is, uh, is a great book to study. So this is that James. This is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. He was the head of the church in Jerusalem. And it's interesting because certain groups think that Peter was the first pope. But notice in the progression that Peter speaks first, then Paul and Barnabas, and then James... And in that culture, the one to speak last would have had the last word. They would have the definitive say. They would wait for the authority to speak. And now James is that authority because he speaks last. So James is actually the, the leader here, not Peter and not Paul, which is interesting to think about. Brethren, listen to me. And then he starts to, to lay out some interesting things here. He says, Simon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Now, he's about to quote Amos. And it's all through the Old Testament where, where we hear about the Gentiles being called by God. But he's about to quote a passage out of Amos. And what's fascinating about this is that this passage in Amos is explained as what God is doing now through Christ and through the Jew Jews taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Often when you read something in the Old Testament, if you don't understand it, look to see if it's quoted in the New Testament. Because the New Testament is the best commentary on the Old Testament. You know, people we sometimes hit roadblocks in the Old Testament. If it's relayed in the New Testament, it will tell you what it is, is saying, what, what it means. And so it says here, with this, the word of the prophets agree. So he's saying... What Simon said is true, that we know this is true because it's said in the prophets. So let me talk to you about Amos. And now he quotes Amos. After these things I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. And Jesus was born in the line of David. And I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name. See, we're Gentiles. We weren't born with the promise but we are called by God's name to be his children. Says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. So he right there quotes uh, Amos and says, this passage is being fulfilled through what we're seeing by the Gentiles who are being called by God and who are putting their faith in him. And that that they may seek the Lord. So you've got mankind may seek the Lord and God may call. So that's how God works, right? God's calling, people are seeking, it works, it's symbiotic. And he says, making these things known from long ago. Therefore, verse 19, it is my judgment that we do not trouble or burden those who are turning to God from the Gentiles. But we write to them that they, and now he's going to give four things. All right, now I'm going to read the four things, and some of these are probably going to go, that seems kind of weird, and then I'll try to explain it, and hopefully it'll make sense to all of us. It says, we write to them that they should abstain or keep away from things contaminated by idols, from fornication, from what is strangled, and from blood. So, things contaminated by idols. So, remember, the Greeks grew up going to idolatrous temples all the time. And they would take sacrifices to the temples. And one thing that the gods liked were they liked meat, right? So you would take, let's say you take a roast and you go, you know, put it on the altar for a sacrifice 
to Dagon or Marduk or whomever, and they would say, okay, thank you for your offering, um, you know, and then they would take the meat, and they would take it out of the temple, and they'd take it right next door to the temple to the, sh the shop that sold meat, and all this meat that was sacrificed to idols would be sold in a shop that was adjacent to the temple for really good deals, okay, like, you know, a third the price. And so people would, you know, they wanted, you know, you know, they wanted to eat meat, so they'd go get meat that was sacrificed to idols, and they'd take it home and cook it, and they'd eat it. And so, it was, it was, I mean, it, you know, there's no overhead, you know. It, it, they're, giving it to the, they're giving it to the temple, so whatever the temple sells it for is, is, is all profit. So they just walk it over there and sell it, and it's sold like crazy. And so with this whole problem with this meat sacrificed to idols, and Christians in the, in the early church struggle with this. Do I eat meat that was sacrificed to idols? Or do I not? Idols are nothing. So that's probably not a problem. But it's going to offend some Christians. So how do I deal with this? And so this was a real controversy. Okay? A real controversy. Is this right? Is this wrong? It's covered in Galatians. It's covered in Romans 14. Sorry, Galatians. Pardon me. Covered in Corinthians. It's covered in Romans 14. Where he wrestles through this, this thing about how do you handle it with meat sacrificed to idols. We realize as we get further and further down the line with the Jews and the Gentiles situation that if you go into somebody's home and they put meat before you, don't say, hey, was this sacrificed to an idol? Oh, I don't eat that. He says, just eat what's in front of you and do it with graciousness. And that's fair, right? You know, if, if I, you know, I used to come down to Ohio and buy Skyline Chili. Well, it was Michigan, but it was close enough. And then I would take it back to Canada. And I remember people would come in and look at it and say, what is this? And I'd say, you don't want it. No, no, what is it? I'd say, trust me. I don't want you to even try it. Because the cans that I bought, I had to bring 200 miles home, okay? If you don't want this, I don't want to throw it out. You know? Um, I'd say it was sacrificed to an idol. But you know how people are picky? They're like, oh, I don't like this. I don't like that. He's saying, just sit, eat what's put in front of you and eat it with Thanksgiving. And don't ask. All right? So that's kind of the teaching that evolves on the meat sacrifice to idols. But initially, it was stop going to the butcher shop near the, near the temple because it's been contaminated by an idol and trying to serve that to your Jewish brethren. That will offend them. Because the heart of the gospel here is what? It's not that he's giving them four laws now. You don't have to be circumcised, but we're going to give you four more laws. What he's saying is, as you interact with Jews, here are four things that are going to completely offend them. So if you Gentiles can avoid these four things, you Jews and Gentiles should be able to get along and have harmony in the church. As the church continues to grow, the meat sacrificed to idols will morph a little bit. And by the time we get to Romans, can you throw the Romans verse up for me? Yeah, you got it. He says this, Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. So the heart of the gospel is, if it's going to offend somebody, don't eat it. Even though your conscience is clear, and you can do it, don't eat it. There's certain things that I have the liberty to do, but as a pastor, I, I do not do them because I do not want to offend. All right? And I'm not saying, like, look at me. I'm just saying, like, you've got to come to your own convictions, and you've got to look and say, these are my convictions, and then say, okay, are there things that I do that may offend? And if there are, I think we need to, we need to, not participate in that. Um, so, meat, so it says, first thing was, contaminated by idols, because that would offend the, their Jewish brethren, and we don't want to offend them. The next thing is fornication. Can you pull up the Ephesians 2, 3 verse? Now, it says uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, it's uh, pretty intense. I can, I can grab it, if you don't have it. All right. Sorry. I don't usually read out of these pages so they get stuck together. Just kidding. Um, all right, it says, uh, Among them, we too were formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of our flesh and in the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And he's talking about being a son of disobedience, how the Jewish people were. Now, obviously when we read fornication, Illicit sexual relationships, I mean, that's pretty much an obvious thing. But one thing the Jews, the Jews uh, were very concerned about was uh, the practice of, um, of, of 
intermarrying within your family. Like, you know, you couldn't marry your, your close relative like your brother or sister. It, by the time they laid the law out, they tried to say, you'd marry within the tribe, but don't marry kind of like your sister thing. You know what I mean? So, um, so what they're saying is, is the Gentiles, they had no prohibitions against that at all. Interfamily marrying, all kinds of stuff. So they're saying, when they say fornication, they're saying any illicit sexual relationship, but they're also saying that Leviticus, because this really covers Leviticus 17 and 18, these four things, that Leviticus 18, it lays down that, you know, you shouldn't marry a close relative like that. And we have laws, obviously, about intermarrying with a certain level of cousins. I don't know every state law and, and what cousins you can marry and what you can't, to be honest with you. But um, I know we have laws in the books about that to try to help with, uh, with uh, genetic defects. So this kind of thing with fornication, they'd say, um, don't participate in these things. Now, you've got to realize the Gentiles went to temples, and at the temples, there were, they, they had temple prostitution. Okay, so as an act of worship, they would uh, go in and see a prostitute. That was part of, of it. So, I mean, the chasm between the Jews and the Gentiles was massive. And so now they're saying avoid fornication. Any illicit sexual relationship and, and try not to marry if you're not married within your clan because that will offend the Jews. Okay, that's, that's fair. All right. It says what is strangled. Um, and that just deals with the fact that uh, the kosher killing would be to cut the jugular and uh, the Gentiles would, would, would kill any old way, and uh, they wanted to make sure there wasn't a fence there in, in how animals were being slaughtered. It's actually the most uh, humane way to kill an animal to this day, to slice the jugular and drain the blood out. That's what the teaching was in the Old Testament. Um, you know, we've had some problems with our meat sometimes with contamination, because when you electrocute a cow, what happens to the fecal matter? Okay. What we need to cut the jugular. Yeah, I'm sorry. You guys can all fast through lunch, okay? <laughs> Everyone's going to go to lunch. Yeah, I'll take the salad, please. <laughs> that meat may have been sacrificed to an idol, or a cow may have defecated when it got electrocuted. Oh, my gosh. It was a cooked well. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, all right. And, uh, well, the Jews would have been offended by it, you know? I can hear them even now. It's horrible. It's, what are they doing? It's horrible. Um, that meat. Okay, and then the blood. The last thing was from blood. And uh, we're getting through this together, surviving. Um, and again, Leviticus uh, talks in chapter 17 extensively about the blood. If you can pull up verse 11. It says, uh, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. And for this reason, uh, for it is the blood uh, by reason of life that makes atonement. So, the shedding of the blood created the atonement, which is why Christ's blood had to be shed, which is why at the temple those animals were, were, were slaughtered and their blood was poured out. It was to make atonement. Um, Gentiles had no problem eating, eating blood. And I know in certain cultures the blood sausage and other blood stuff, you know, certain cultures do still eat blood. And uh, that, that was anathema to any, any Jew. So they're saying here, that you need to reconsider how you see blood. So three of these are kind of dietary laws that, hey, you know, that's going to really offend, you know, you invite a Jew over and you're trying to serve them, even though they can eat pork or blood sausage, it's going to, you know, it's going to really bother them. It's going to offend them. And it's going to create this, this distinction. God has not created a distinction. So we don't want to have a non-essential like what we eat create distinctions and offense, right? And that's kind of three of these rules. Are This is what's going to offend your Jewish brethren. Avoid these. Um, can you pull up the Hebrews passage, 9.22? And he says there, according to the law, one may uh, almost say, all things cleanse with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So we know that verse, that Jesus' blood had to be shed. The blood was shed on the altar. The Gentiles didn't have a problem consuming blood. It's very unhealthy to consume, consume blood. And now they're saying, avoid these. And he says this, um, he says this, he said, um, lays out those four things. He says, from Moses, from, from uh, ancient generations in every city who has preached since he has read in the synagogues every Sabbath. 
And he says, it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church. So what they did was they said, we're going to take this teaching, we're going to take it to the synagogues, we're going to take it to the Gentiles, we're going to let everybody know this is what we think would be good for them to do. And he actually says that within the letter. And they chose, it says, it says it seemed good to the apostles and elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch. Paul and Barnabas, Judas called uh, Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men of the brethren. So initially, that group of men were sent out with this letter. But they were sent out by the apostles and elders. Um, and and they, they chose them. And they were sent out. And it's interesting because it says here, uh, it, it actually has the letter documented. They sent this letter to them. The apostles and brethren who are elders to the, church in, to the church of the brethren in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, and who are from among the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number, to whom we gave no instruction, have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls, so they're speaking right to the fact that Judaizers have come in, not from Jerusalem, not, not with any kind of approval, by the apostles and elders, but they have come into you guys and they've disturbed you by saying you need to be circumcised it's, and follow the customs of Moses. It seems good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, whom themselves will also report the same things by the word of mouth, Again, you got two, three, you got four witnesses now that will report this. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. So they say, there's no other burden we're going to lay on you. Not circumcision, not following all the customs of Moses, which are completely foreign to you. We're going to give you four essentials because the heart of the gospel is love. Loving your neighbor as yourself. And so to love them and to have a unified body You've got to do these four things not to offend your Jewish brethren, is what they're saying here. That you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication. So he kind of puts the three dietary laws together, and then from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. And that was the letter. These are the four things we tell you to do. And that will help you interface with your Jewish brethren. And will not cause a stumbling block or an offense to them. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. So there was rejoicing among the Gentiles when they received this because they understood they love us, they're giving us this instruction because they want us and the, and the, the Jews to be one body. And we can't be one body if we're constantly offending them in things we eat, which are normal to us, but are completely offensive to them because of the laws they grew up with, and we love them more than we love our blood sausage. We love them more, right? And it should be that way. We should be willing to give up things as a body if it offends somebody else. Because whatever that liberty we have is it really that important if it's going to cause offense? Because if I really love somebody else, I'm going to be very cautious about how I may or may not offend them. Now, on the other hand, you can have the weaker brother that is always offended by everything, and they have to, you know, they have to get a little stronger. But I will tell you this. I had a man tell me years ago. He was a social drinker. He's a good, good friend of mine. We, he came to Bible study every Friday. Good guy up in Buffalo, and he got up and confessed because his son became an alcoholic. And he said, what I did in moderation, my, my son took to the extreme. And I remember Kevin saying that, and I felt great compassion for him because no one wants their kid to get involved in any substance that's going to control their lives. I was, I was a young dad. Then... <laughs> And I thought to myself, and I still think, what in my life needs to go, right? If I'm constantly drawn to, like, media that's questionable, you know, comedies or 
that's a temptation for me, or music, big temptation. Music, big temptation. How is that going to affect the worldview of my three children? I thought about that a lot. Because I thought, I don't want to stumble them in their walk with Christ. And I've been far from a perfect dad. But we need to think about these things. A lot of us grew up in families that went to church and came home, and it was a Sunday thing, and Monday through Saturday, we lived like the world. Our, our media on our television, our music choices, our thoughts, what we talked about, did not reflect the gospel. It looked like a secular, moral family. And I say that to say, I'm not trying to condemn anybody, I'm not trying to tell anybody anybody's any better than each other. I'm saying this is serious stuff. And we do not, we, you know, we have kids. We have church kids that we need to love, that we need to not stumble. And if they look to the adults and say, the adults say it's okay to do fill in the blank, how will that stumble them? And I'm not a legalist. I'm not trying to put laws or burdens on people. I'm just trying to say the application here is, what is it that we may participate in that we have no conviction about but may stumble somebody else? And we need to take that to the Lord. We need to take that to the Lord. Because we don't want to be an offense to people. And we live in a time where, to be honest with you, uh, Christian music has in many ways caught up and surpassed secular music. Like, it's really good. It's not like it was when I was a kid. Uh, there's some dark days, okay? It was like some wilderness wanderings, all right? Okay? It's changed, right? And I know everybody laughs at Christian movies, but they, they are getting better. And I'm not saying you need to sit home and watch the Hallmark Channel. I'm just saying you need to think through every choice you make and how those, because you're all leaders, people are all looking to each one of us. They are. How will that affect the person that is watching me do what I do? All right? How will that affect them? So just pray about that. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just telling you to pray about it. And remember that when we willingly say no to something because we love our brother or sister, that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Because that's saying I love them more than I love my little thing I've got going on over here. Okay? And that's exactly what the heart of the gospel is. The heart of the gospel is agape love. And I want you to feel it from this church. I want you to sense it when you're here. I want you to just know how much we care about you. And as you learn the word, and the word continues to do a work in your life, I want you to realize that this is, this is serious. And this is what James is coming down to, is the agape love is avoid those four things so you don't offend your Jewish brethren, because the greater the greater good is to pray, pray together, study the word together, bear each other's burdens. That's the law of Christ. Not, you know, hey, I want to go off and, and head to the temple and buy some cheap meat, right? That may offend them. Don't do that. Eat vegetables if you have to, all right? Okay, let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word, and I, I just pray. I don't know exactly where you're working on each person this morning, but Lord, you do. And I know that as we think about things that, uh, questionable things that could offend other believers, Lord, we want to always come down uh, on, the, on the side of love and on sensitivity to those around us. So help us, Lord, to just exude agape love. May those who interact with us just sense the love of Jesus Christ. Not because we're great people, but because we have a great Savior. And help us to digest what this Jerusalem Council was coming down to and how they were exhorting the church uh, of the Gentiles to conduct themselves in a way that they wouldn't offend their Jewish brethren and to put and to prioritize people over things. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.